All right, guys. The name of this message is going to be called Handle My Lightweight. <laughs> Handle My Lightweight. That may sound familiar to some of you, but let me just explain what this sermon is about. Perhaps you are somebody who, it's almost like you're somebody's buddy, somebody's sidekick, somebody's right-hand man, so to speak. There's somebody that you're always there for. You always help them in their times of need. You know, anything that they need, you are the perfect assistant. And you love what you do. You don't mind being that second in charge, second in command, and never really being first. That doesn't bother you. That's not the issue. The issue is that you have been made to feel less than. You've been belittled. And it's probably to the point now for weeks, months, maybe even years now that all this time has gone by that you have felt so unappreciated because whenever you just want just, just a little moment, a little moment to shine a little bit, you get held back. And it's not that you don't have the ability to shine, the ability to stand out, the ability to kind of do something on your own, do something for yourself. It's almost as if every time you really try to step out of your comfort zone and do something, it's like you get made to feel like you're stepping out of bounds. And maybe you've tolerated it, but maybe it's even gotten to the point where if you do stand up for yourself and you do say something in the nicest way and try to explain that, why not? It's only fair that I get a chance to do blah, blah, blah. You not only get made to feel bad for standing up for yourself, but if you even get the slightest bit angry, the fact that you got angry about it also gets held against you, even to the point where maybe you, you're made to feel like less of a Christian for simply getting angry. But we should know as Christians that it's not really being angry that's a problem. We all get angry. It's what we do out of anger. That's the problem. Acting out in a bad way out of anger can be the issue. But all because you simply got a little frustrated you're made to feel like you're just not setting a good example and it looks bad on you and therefore it looks bad on them when you get a little angry because you can't have your own little moment to shine, your own moment to do something special without having to have everybody's permission. It's aggravating, it's insulting, you feel so belittled, you don't know what to do. And it's almost like you're always being told, you know what, just, just handle my lightweight. Handle this simple stuff over here. Let me deal with the big stuff. And it could be different things. It could be this way in the workplace, in your marriage, in your friendships, you know, a relationship, a ministry, I don't know. But maybe you're struggling with the fact that it seems like you never get to have your little moment that you want to have. And you're held back and you can't quite figure out what it is. You can't quite figure out what you've done wrong, why you're being done this way, why you're being made to feel like a little child when you feel like you're being very mature about it. And I'm here to tell you that whoever this is for, it's not that something is wrong with you. It's about what all is right with you. You're being quote unquote punished because you want to go about things the right way, the fair way. And you're following somebody who has their own agenda in mind. And because you're willing to do what's right, even when they're not, that's actually being held against you. So you may have gifts and talents. You may be able to sing or dance or act. You may be able to play an instrument. You may be really good at uh, coming up with concepts and ideas, creating things. You're an inventor. I don't know. But your abilities and your gifts and your talents are being held back and, st and, and, and stifled and suffocated to an extent. All because you are led by someone who can be a bit jealous, 
who doesn't want to be outshined and it has to be about them whether they say it or not it has to be about them so they always have an excuse as to why you can't stand out for just a moment they always have an excuse you're too this you're too that too short too skinny too black too white you're too sick, you're not strong enough, you don't know enough, you're not experienced enough, too poor, too this, too that. You don't have it all together yet. But they've got a million excuses as to why you can't do something that clearly you possess the ability to do. You have the ability to do things that they can't. And so that jealousy is used to hold you back. That and the fact that you're willing to serve God even when they're not. And so really, they're holding things against you that should not be held against you. You're just being told, handle my lightweight, handle the easy stuff. I'll do this hard stuff. And in reality, the things that they call the hard stuff probably isn't all that hard for you but you're being made to feel as though you just can't do it. Let's go ahead and jump into scripture here, and we're mostly going to be in Acts, and let me just say, you know, the thing that came to mind getting ready for this sermon was women in ministry, and I, I don't know why, you know, this could be for a woman, it could be for a guy, I don't know, but I really felt like I should mention women in ministry, and what I mean is this, you know, there was a time when a lot of people, a lot of Christians would not take a woman preacher seriously. They for sure wasn't going to take a woman apostle or a woman, uh, a female prophet serious. They just weren't having it. And now people have become more accepting of it. But even though we do see a lot of uh, female preachers and teachers and ministers, this, that, and the other, in our local churches, on TV, wherever, you still have some churches, especially in the Bible Belt, where they just, they don't want it. And they look at it as, you know, <laughs> you know they're being forced to be politically correct uh, to, to, you know, if, if they... Uh, say that they're okay with it, and they're really not. They're just being forced to be politically correct to please people and please the world, which is just ridiculous. And and they, they look at it as, we don't want to be PC about this. We just want to be honest about this and be direct. We really just don't want to have anything to do with this. We don't want to have anything to do with a woman leading us in anything, not in prayer, not in learning things about the scripture, not in a little Sunday school class, you know, anything like that. But you'll have folks to where they feel that way, but they keep it held in. And what they'll actually do is they'll even do things like if they know that they're going to have a, a female minister in the church, if they feel like, not enough people will uh, stand their ground on the issue. They'll just flat out leave that church and go somewhere else where there's nothing but male ministers. And the thing is, it's to the point where there are some male preachers, pastors, so on, that know this fact. And since they know that sometimes in some places it can be hard for female ministers to make their way up in the ranks in some places, there will be some who may take advantage of that reality. And what they'll do is when they do get a female minister, they may put them through the ringer, put them through so much, make them feel like they have to be their right-hand man or, or woman, rather, and always give in to what they say. And they can even bully that female minister because they'll have the mindset of, well, they're not going to have an easy time sliding their way up in the ranks at other churches in this area, so they will put up with whatever I want them to put up with. They'll tolerate whatever I throw at them, and whatever I want them to do or say, they'll do it. 
Even if it's not of God, even if it's not right, whatever I can get them to do, I'll get them to do it. They'll be my flunky. They'll do whatever because they'll know that it won't be so easy because they may have had it a little hard getting here to this point now. And so I don't know, that just kind of came to my mind while getting ready for this sermon. Maybe that'll help somebody listening. I, I don't know. Maybe it's going to all tie into all that I have to say. But let's just dive right into scripture here. Acts, starting in Acts chapter 22, this is Paul, who was known as Saul speaking. And by the way, Saul of the New Testament, as I've mentioned uh, in the past before, the Saul of the uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament are two completely different Saul's. The one of the New Testament, the one that we're reading about here, he later uh, has his name changed to Paul. He is later known as Paul instead of Saul. But anyway, this is him speaking, and it says this, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up into this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. So he's letting them know that he is a Jew. He's letting them know that he is a religious man, that he knows the law like the back of his hand. He's not just anybody. He's someone who is a bit educated and knows things about uh, the word of God. But uh, as we know, uh, prior to this moment, he was somebody who persecuted Christians. He had not fully accepted Christ and Christianity yet. He believed in God the Father, but he had a hard time accepting Jesus as the Son of God, the Son of the Father. So he's just still in this religious Jew mindset, but he's letting them know, hey, you know, I'm somebody that is a Jew. I was very zealous toward God. I was very hungry for his, his word, his law, his will. Just as crazy about God as many of you all are listening to me right now. Verse 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. So he's saying, you know, I'm somebody who, you know, listen, these high priests, they can bear witness unto this person that I am. I was someone who served the elders, and I, you know, received letters and sent letters to and from to make sure that certain folks got persecuted and put in prison, making sure people got killed. I was one of those people. But go down to verse 20, and he says this. He says, And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Here he's saying, you know, there was a guy named Stephen. I know that y'all know who he is. He was martyred for the name of Jesus' sake. And when there were people killing him, stoning him to death, I was the one who was holding their raiment, holding their coats for them. Now, obviously, <laughs> I'm not rooting for him, you know, in this particular uh, part of the speech where he's saying that uh, he stood by and watched somebody get martyred, watched somebody get stoned to death because they believed on Jesus. But we see here that he's basically saying, and I hadn't really thought about it much up until this particular time that I read this story to get ready for this particular sermon, but I come to realize that it's almost like he's saying, I missed out on an opportunity. Up until this point when I read this story, I just looked at it as he was saying, you know, I, you know, I was in there with him, and I, you know, I did this and I did that, you know, and he was. But now it's almost like he's saying, you know, I didn't really get my fair share in some of the persecutions that went on. I was, I was there, and I was wrong for being a part of it, 
But the thing is, I didn't even really get to have my moment to really shine. I didn't really get to show off how well I could throw them rocks. <laughs> I didn't really get to show off my aiming skills, you know. I was the one that, that kind of had to stand back and hold everybody's coats while they went and got to have their fun. And I come to realize when reading it, it's almost as if he was saying he had to handle everybody's lightweight. Everybody else got to pick up rocks and throw them and have a good time persecuting people, thinking that they're actually doing the will of God. But while they got to have fun, he had to handle their lightweight. Those rocks just were too heavy for him in their eyes. He had to just hold their coat, hold their raiment, hold their garments while they went and did the hard stuff, the heavy stuff. He just had to stand back and handle their lightweight. And so maybe some of you are feeling this way, like you just had to handle the lightweight. But let me tell you, what it basically comes down to is this. The issue is that you're watching, whoever this is for, you're watching some people that you look up to that have influence over you do things that they ought not. Persecuting other Christians, possibly. Doing things that they shouldn't. Doing things contrary to the word. And you're so determined to show your allegiance, to have your alliance with them, and you keep trying to prove yourself to them but every time they get to go and do certain things that you want to be involved in they say oh no just handle our lightweight just stand back and do this stand back and watch and you never really get to participate in the action but the reality of it is God is actually doing you a favor God's helping you out because he's keeping you from getting a little bit too involved with these folks, these folks that you keep trying to be the right-hand man or right-hand woman of. You feel left out. You keep thinking, how come I can't do this and do that? And it's mean and it's wrong that they don't give you the opportunity to shine, but there are some things that you don't need to be trying to shine in. And so even though they're pushing you away, this is actually God keeping you pushed away to not get involved in things that are going to be contrary to his word. It's wrong that they're holding you back from the good stuff you want to do, but it's good that you're being held back from the wrong stuff that you keep trying to do. Because the good things that you want to do, where you, where you show off your gifts and talents that God has given you, that's a good thing. And it's wrong that you're being held back, but, but you've got to understand that these things that you want to do contrary to what God is telling you, you're only doing it to try to show allegiance to man. And that is not what you need to be doing. Because it's only going to ruin your witness. It's only going to ruin your ministry. It's only going to diminish the gifts and the callings that God has stored up for you that you've not quite been allowed to do much of just yet. God can make a way for you to be able to do these things, but you're going to have to be willing to stand your ground and not be a part of the nonsense that the others are partaking in just because you want to show that you can be a good little assistant. Let's go further into this. Still in Acts, but going to chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 50. Here, we're backing up here in Scripture, of course. We're backing up. And we're seeing what Stephen, the one who was martyred, that, that uh, Paul was mentioning in his speech, we're seeing what he had to say right before he was persecuted, right before he was stoned to death. Now, he had said a bunch of stuff prior to this, but I'm just going to start here at verse 50. He's talking to some religious folks that just want to take him out. 
But he's standing his ground and he says this, Hath not my hand made all these things? So he's speaking on behalf of God now. He's quoting what God has said. Hath not my hand made all these things? Saying God has made all. 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Is that not what I just talked about in the last sermon? How it's not the outward circumcision that matters now, thanks to Jesus. It's the circumcision of the heart, the change of the heart. He's saying, ye stiff-necked, or how we will say it today, ye hard-headed mugs, <laughs> ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Your heart's not open to receive Jesus. You don't have the ears to hear or the heart to receive what the Holy Spirit is saying unto you. Oh, my goodness. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. Capital J, capital O, talking about Jesus, the just one. Of whom ye have been now betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Y'all are all about this law. Y'all are all about persecuting somebody and stoning them to death, even though you don't always follow it all to a T yourselves. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Oh, my goodness. Some cutting happened. Remember, I talked about that last sermon. Some cuttings taking place by his speech, by Stephen's words. They're being cut a little bit. Getting to that heart, getting that heart circumcision going on. But they don't want that. They don't want the heart to be circumcised. So let's look at this. And they gnashed on him with their teeth, verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Stephen is just showing out. He's telling them how it is. But look at how they respond. Verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. You know what that kind of makes me think of? You know when you try to tell a little kid something and they're really immature. And, they, and, and you, you're trying to tell them something and they don't want to hear it. And what do they do? They, they close their ears up like this, right? Put their hands over their ears, and they go like this. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. <laughs> right? That's basically what they're doing. They, they don't want to hear it. Not because what he's saying isn't true, but they don't want the circumcision of the heart. They don't have the ears to hear or heart to receive. They don't want to hear the truth about themselves. They don't want to hear it, so they... <laughs> Just being immature about it, being kids about it, stopping up their ears, shouting with a loud voice, and it says, and they ran upon him with one accord. I'm going to come back to that, but let me keep reading. And cast him out of the city and stone him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So now we've ha we have backtracked and we see when and where this first played out. We see that as they were doing these things and stoning Stephen and attacking him, what did they do? That's how they treated Saul. They looked at Saul and just threw their clothes down at him and said, okay, just watch our stuff. Just handle our lightweight. We're supposed to go after this dude. He's trying to tell us the truth about ourselves. We, we can't have this nonsense. Right? <laughs> handle our lightweight. We got this guy. We, we, we got him. Now, all them people th throwing stones, but, but they treat Saul like he's got to stand over. You know what I mean? Like it's too much for him, even though it's a whole bunch of people against one dude throwing rocks at him. And this dude has no desire to fight him back. You know what I mean? It's not like he's coming at him with weaponry. He ain't coming with a sword. He's just, he, well, he is. He's coming with the sword of God, the, the, the words coming out of his mouth. But as for actual, you know, ammo, he's not coming at him with anything. You know, so, you know, 
would it have been too much for little Saul to go and throw something? No, but they still had to say to him, no, just handle our lightweight, <laughs> you know, but we see it there. We see that moment right there, but going back up to where it says when they went after uh, Stephen, when they ran after him, they did it in one accord. I'm going to show you what the issue is with that right there. The issue is that, see, they, they had it. They almost had it together. They came together in one accord, or listen, they came together in unity over something. The problem was that they came together in unity against God and against God's people instead of coming into unity over Jesus Christ. And that's what caused their problems. They had a unity for themselves, a unity for the flesh, a unity for man-made traditions, a unity for all these things, but they would not come together in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what their ultimate problem was. Yeah, they knew the law of God. Yeah, they, you know, they, they believed on God, but they didn't have the son in their hearts because they, they weren't allowing themselves to have that, that heart circumcision. But backing up even further to chapter 4, still in Acts, but chapter 4, let's look at verse 13. And what has happened up until this point is you have Peter and John, and they there was a miracle that had happened through them, this man who needed to be healed, got healed and was made whole. And there was this big hoorah about it. There were some religious folks that just, y'all know how it is. Y'all saw how it played out in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know how it is when, when Jesus was doing all these miracles and healings and, you know, people just, I mean, they just, there are folks that loved it, but the religious folks couldn't stand it. It was just, they just couldn't stand the fact that it was beyond them and that they had something new to learn and new things to witness and that they didn't know it all and didn't have it all together and they just, they just couldn't have it. But let's look here. The disciples are having to go through the same stuff Jesus did, basically. The same type of persecutions he went through, they had to go through. So now let's look. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They had a hard time accepting the fact that Peter and John in some areas of some subjects were not as smart as they were, but they knew Jesus. Oh my goodness. They knew Jesus and that's what mattered most. Them knowing Jesus, not just knowing of Jesus or hearing of Jesus, but them knowing Jesus and having that Jesus experience that they had, that right there accounted for so much more than the religious folks' knowledge of the law. They were mind blown by the power that they had, which really it was Jesus's power that they had, not their own, but they were so mind blown by the miraculous power that was operating through them because they were so unlearned compared to them, the religious folks. And they just had a hard time accepting that. They had a hard time accepting the fact that folks that didn't know all that much about certain things as they did had so much more power. They just could not stand it. They just looked at them as ignorant men, but they were still mind blown and astonished by their power verse 14 and beholding the man which was healed standing with them they could say nothing against it whoever this is for you may have these folks who that's all they want to do is tell you oh you don't know enough yet you, you're, you're you're too ignorant compared to me let me handle this and years have gone down the line that they were supposed to have taught you this and taught you that, but all they want to do is still make you feel ignorant, which, if you are, is really just a reflection on them, right? C come on, come on. So e even if you are, it's not like it's your fault, right? Come on. They're scared it's going to look bad on them. Well, if you are ignorant, it already does look bad on them because they did not nourish you and feed you the way they should have. Come on. So what difference would it really make? But they didn't know what to say. And same with you. Every time you do step out of the box a little bit 
and show what you can really do, they, they, they won't know what to say. They can't compliment you because they have to drop their pride a little bit to, to be willing to compliment you and genuinely say you did a good job without just mockingly, sarcastically saying it. So they can't really give you your props. So they, they're just left saying nothing sometimes. 15, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred amongst themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. They were willing to threaten them. And whoever this may be for, maybe you're afraid to stand up for yourself and not allow yourself to be made to feel like just some little lightweight that has to handle somebody's lightweight all the time. And listen, maybe you're afraid that if you stand up for yourself just a little bit, just a little bit too much, You'll be threatened, maybe not necessarily with your life, but maybe with a position that you have. You'll lose your position or your title, your spot in something. But listen, if you want to move up some, you might as well say something. In other words, if you think about it, what do you really have to lose? You have something to gain, but really not much to lose because how much more further are you going to go if you don't stand up for yourself? Maybe you're just looking at things the wrong way. Maybe you just got to, listen, get your priorities lined up with how you look at things. Maybe when it comes to your actions, you know, your priorities are all together and you want to do this and that for God and you want to do this and that. But listen, with the way you look at things, your mindset, if you would just get it all lined up and understand your self-worth, Understand that you are worthy and you are somebody and you're not a nothing. Things would change just a little bit. Let's look at this. Verse 18, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. In other words, stop what you're doing. You're doing too much. Yeah, it's not a bad thing, but it's making us look bad. So we, we need y'all to tone it down. Verse 20. Or sorry, verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Oh my goodness. In verse 19, Peter and John, they're letting it be known, listen, we care more about being submissive to what God has to say than what you have to say. So if you're saying one thing and God's saying something else and these two different things are not adding up, they're contrary, we're going with what God has to say. And that's the mindset you have to have. I've got to go with what God has to say. I don't care how long we've been friends. I don't care how long I've been your sidekick. I don't care about the things that you did for me years ago in the past that you still keep bringing up and holding over my head and saying, well, you know, I did this for you, and if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be here right now, uh, blah, 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 blah. Come on. And then in verse 20, uh, they're saying, listen, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. It's almost as if they're saying, well, you might not have the ears to hear and the heart to receive, but we have had the ears to hear and the heart re to receive, and that's how we know what to speak. We know what to say and how to stand on the word of God because we've received it unlike you. You're mad because of the abilities that we have, but it's because we've submitted when you haven't. We have received the circumcision of the heart. Verse 21, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Maybe you standing up for yourself isn't just about you. Maybe... 
maybe not only would God get the glory out of it, but maybe some other people, oh, come on, maybe some other folks might get their freedom too. Maybe some other folks might be inspired to stand on the word of God too. Maybe it won't just help you, but maybe there's some other folks silently sitting by, standing by watching who could benefit from seeing you stand when no one else is willing to stand. Maybe they're sitting there watching and maybe now they might have a chance to stand up and rise up too because you stood up and said something. Look at this. Verse 22, for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was shewed and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the thief, or sorry, all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, oh, come on, and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is uh oh peter and john are starting to sound like old stephen when he was talking about god making everything they're saying didn't he make the heaven and the earth didn't he make the sea 25 who by the mouth of the servant david has said why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against the Christ. For of a truth against the holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Lord, look at their threatenings. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Verse 31 and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake with the word of God with boldness. If you notice, after all the threatenings and all the persecutions coming their way, Peter and John decide, no, let's come together. Let's not scatter. Let's not run. Let's not flee. Let's stand up for ourselves, but more importantly, let's stand on the word of God and let's come together in unity. Let's come together in one accord. And then in verse 31, we read of a move of God, this supernatural shaking, this sudden shaking took place and people being filled with the Holy Ghost. The greatest moves of God sometimes happen when people are outnumbered. It seems like their backs are against the wall, but it's all about standing firm in unity when it seems like everybody else is together in unity or in one accord against the Lord. That's when you have to stand on the word of the Lord. Stand on the solid rock that is Jesus. A matter of fact, still in Acts, but backing up all the way to chapter 2, there's a moment where something else similar plays out, and it's a very uh, popular area in the Bible, especially for those of us that are Pentecostal. We know this moment in Acts chapter 2. Just reading the first few verses, it says, and when that day of Pentecost was fully come that day when they were all in that upper room. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, here comes that suddenly again, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Spirit, capital S, 
the Holy Spirit moving upon the people who had the ears to hear and the heart to receive what the Spirit had to say. It's all about who's willing to be open to Jesus Christ. It's, con it's important that you continue to stand and listen. You may be thinking, well, you know, uh, I, you know I, I don't think very many people will, will, will uh, believe what it is that I have to say when I talk about how I'm being done wrong. People won't believe me. People won't believe that I'm being treated the way that I am. People won't believe the scenarios that I've been in. And those that do know, they, you know, they may throw up their hands and not want to have anything to do with this. They don't want to stand up for themselves. So they would just rather pretend that they don't know what I'm talking about. Everybody just wants to stay out of it. They just want to try to play it safe. But listen, it, it listen, it's not about having huge numbers of people backing you up. It doesn't matter if it's just you and one other person. If you don't believe me, go to Matthew chapter 18, just reading a few verses here. It says this, verily, and this is Jesus speaking, verily I say unto you, or truly, truly, for sure, as we would say, keeping it 100 for sure, for real. <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying. For real, for sure, truly, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. It doesn't take very much. It doesn't take numerous amounts of people. If you find just one other person that will pray with you simply in private about the issues that you're going through, that they're going through. If you would come together and join together and hold hands in agreement and pray and believe for a move of God, things very well can happen in God's timing. But you must believe and you must stand even when it seems like nobody else will. Finally, I want to take you to the very last place I'm going to take you. It's in Judges, the book of Judges, chapter 3. Prior to this uh, particular verse, I'm going to start in 12, but prior to this, we just keep seeing where the children of Israel, they're serving God, and the next thing you know, they stop serving God. They start uh, marrying uh, into uh, uh, families of people who do not serve the one true God, but false gods. And so they get with these women who worship these false gods, and so they start to worship those false gods, and they begin to sin and commit idolatry, and they do everything but please the one true God, and God gets upset, and so he will turn them over to, you know, a king or some leader who doesn't treat them right, and then when they get tired of being done wrong by that king, God comes into the rescue and delivers them from that king and from the people of that king. And so his people go back to serving him again. And then next thing you know, his people, the Israelites, turn right back around and go right back to doing the nonsense they were doing. It just seems like it's a, it's a repetitive cycle. It's like they won't just serve him and him alone. They just keep running off. And so verse 12, it says this, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So again, they're just going right back to their own thing. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. So he gives, he allows the king of, of the Moabites to have some, some rule over his people because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 13, and he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, 
the king of Moab. So God's people have cried out, God, help us rescue us from this king. Yes, we rebelled. Yeah, we, we kind of deserve what was coming to us. But God, we, we want to do what it is that you want us to do now. We've had enough. We've paid some heavy prices for being in sin, for transgressing your law, from, from turning away from you. God, please take us back. And so God's like, okay, I'm going to send someone to rescue you from this, which, of course, we know is just types and shadows of what Jesus does in the New Testament, coming to the rescue to save God's people. And so this plays out. He gets a guy from Ehud, who is a Benjamite, and it says that he's left-handed, and they have him send a present, so to speak, <laughs> unto the king of Moab, who has rule over them. Verse 16, but Ehud made a dagger, which had two edges. Uh-oh. Let me stop right there. Ehud has a dagger. Supposedly, he's bringing the king a gift, but he, he has this dagger on him, and it's got two edges, and we know that the Bible is a two-edged sword or a double-edged sword. The word lets us know, the scripture lets us know that it itself is a double-edged sword. It's something that when we fight with it spiritually, we can destroy the enemy with one end of the sword, but the other end of the sword can pierce us as well. That circumcision of the heart, right? Come on. Uh, that, that conviction of when we mess up, when we do wrong, sometimes that edge of the sword that's, that points in our direction can offend us. The word offends sometimes, but it's to put us on the right path. But this is not a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged dagger. Well, isn't a dagger simply a small version of a sword? Oh, my goodness. Let me say something. Whoever this is for, You've been told many times to just sit back and handle the lightweight. And all they really been saying this whole time to you is, we're the big boys. We'll carry the heavy swords, but you just carry this little miniature sword. You just carry this dagger. But what they don't realize is the weaponry that they've given you really gives you an advantage it was listen it was given to you to made you feel like you were handicapped compared to them come on but we're about to see in this story that this little dagger that they've given you is just as powerful as the double-edged sword come, oh goodness come on let's keep let's keep looking but he had made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right Thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. And he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. So Ehud gets to be alone with the king. The king does not know he has this dagger. How did he get access to the king this easily without being caught with this dagger? Oh, oh, oh here, here we go. A couple of reasons. Number one, it's not a sword. Oh, my goodness. If it was a sword, he wouldn't have been able to hide it. Now you get what I'm saying when I'm telling you that what was made, put in place to make you feel like you're less than, like you're handicapped compared to everybody else, and you just can't do it, and you're just not on our level just yet. Really, all they've done is set you up to have an advantage, 
So instead of having this sword that can be easily seen, you got a dagger that's fixing to work just as good to get the job done. That little sword, or listen, that little dagger for your little self as they look at you. They look at you as a lightweight, where you got a lightweight weapon, and that lightweight weapon is about to help you in this battle. Another reason is this. When Ehud came in, they probably, if someone did search him or pat him down, they probably patted him down on his left side instead of his right side. You may say, well, what do you mean? Many times, uh, warriors in battle, soldiers, they would either be right-handed, because most people are right-handed, or they would be trained to be right-handed even if they were left-handed, so that everybody would be trained the same way right-handed. And so if you would swing your weapon with your right hand, you would have a sheath to put your weapon in on your left side. So you would pull from your left thigh, pull it out right with your right hand. And so what some people, what some army started to do was they decided to train their people to be specifically left-handed. Why? For the element of surprise in battle, because it was going to be assumed that you would fight with your right hand. So you would not only be fighting and attacking the part of their body if you were using your left hand, that would be unshielded and unguarded, but they would be confused and they, they would have to like try to mirror your moves to block you and it would give them less time to try to figure out how to really fight you back because it would just be so unexpected. So he is coming from a, a tribe of people that are being taught to be left-handed. In other words, instead of being like everybody else, Instead of being like everybody else, just keep being yourself. Instead of pretending that you don't care about what God has said and, oh, don't worry, I'll do what you say because I want to show you my allegiance to you, you need to be who God created you to be. Don't try to get caught up in showing your alliance to man when you have to turn your back on God. Be yourself. So he comes in, he was probably, listen, he was probably patted down on the left side instead of on the right side because they were expecting something to be on the left side because they would assume he would be right-handed even though he's left. He comes in, gets easy access to the king, and watch what happens. Let's look at this. Twenty, and Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And he uh, said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. So Ehud thrust the dagger into the belly of this overweight king, into the belly. Verse 22, and he or sorry, and the heft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed up upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. When he came in for the stab, the king's gut was so hanging out and so just flabby that the fat consumed the dagger and swallowed it up, The king's fat ended up hiding the evidence. Oh my goodness. You're so worried that if you stand up for yourself, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. If you stand up for yourself, people are going to have all kinds of stuff to hold over your head. But if you would just continue to stand up for yourself and do the right thing and not lose your integrity in this when they're doing stuff that they shouldn't, and you need to just hold back. You don't need to be worried about, oh, they said I just have to handle their lightweight while they go out there and persecute people. Why can't I join, a, join in on the persecution? Why can't I be a part of it? No. Come on. 
All you need to do is stand your ground. Don't worry about what people have, what evidence they have to hold against you because the evidence can just be sucked right on up like you didn't even do nothing, like nothing even happened. Oh, my goodness. His belly done sucked up the, the dagger. There ain't even no proof of what's done happened. It, mm, okay, okay, let me keep going. Verse 23, then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. Made a smooth transition right on out of there like nothing even happened. And when they found out something had happened to the king, they just saw that he had fallen over because where was the evidence? <laughs> oh, my goodness. All I'm here to tell you is this, whoever this is for, keep doing the right thing. Don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. Don't be afraid to be small in numbers, kind of like when the word lets us know to not despise small beginnings. I'm going to take it a step further, further and say don't despise small weaponry. Don't despise the small things that you have compared to everybody else because all you need is that small thing. It's okay you ain't got the big sword like everybody else. Use that dagger. Oh, my goodness. Come on. In other words, use the little that you do have, the little bit that you were allowed to have, and use that for your advantage because you have advantages that other folks don't have. God has positioned you in a place where you have access to, to certain folks and certain things that others don't have. And the reason why he can trust you to get the job done for him is because some other folks can't be trusted. So you've been entrusted with this little dagger, but really God has allowed it to be set up this way. Oh my goodness. It's been set up this way for you to get your moment to shine for for real you just didn't see this one coming you thought you were gonna shine some other kind of way and God's like oh I got a way for you to shine all right you're so busy worried about being their right hand man I'm gonna use you to be my right hand man to destroy the enemy and watch this just like how my left hand is the sign of judgment he used his left hand, oh my goodness, he used his left hand to take out the king with the dagger because they thought he would use his right if he was going to do something, oh my goodness. In other words, he came in with the judgment of God in his left hand, just stabby, make stabby stab. <laughs> And, and you have to look at it that way. You've got to look at it as you've got something that others don't. You've got more power than you think. I want to wrap this up by saying this. First off, let me say this. Don't get to a place where you say, well, what if, what if I don't do the right thing and I just, I just go along with these persecutions or these bad things that they're doing and I just keep going along with it and I don't stand up for myself. Well, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, listen, it'll be almost like the people that you are following are like the Saul of the Old Testament. And if you remember that last sermon I did, I ended it by talking about how when Saul was in his last battle, King Saul of the Old Testament, he fell on his own sword. He took himself out. And his armor bearer, listen, or his little sidekick decided, oh, no, and fell on his sword, too. If you continue to go along with this, you'll end up so brainwashed that when their time comes to be removed, God does whatever he's going to do to move them out of the way. Your destruction can very easily come as well because you would not be willing to detach. However, if you do stand your ground and you do continue to hold out a little bit longer until God gives you direction on what to do to take care of business, so to speak, let me say this, you might be worried some folks may not trust you in the long run. They'll say, oh, well, listen, uh, you had somebody that you were a little sidekick to, a little armor bearer to, and when the time came for you to choose whether you were going to take that person's side or God's side, you chose God's side. So why would I take you on as a sidekick now? Why would I take you on as a buddy, as an assistant, as an armor bearer? I can't trust you because you stabbed that person over there in the back. If they say something like that to you, remind them of this story I just read to you here in Judges chapter 3. 
smile at them and simply say this Ehud stabbed that king in his belly that's how that dagger got consumed in other words he didn't stab him in the back he stabbed him in the front I'm, I'm, I'm showing out now I'm gonna quit I'm gonna pray us out here Heavenly Father <laughs> Heavenly Father I thank you for another time to minister another message Lord, I pray that whoever needs this word gets it and receives it wholeheartedly. God, just have your way. Lord, whoever needs this, let them have a boldness and a confidence because, Lord, you did not give us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind, and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We have to be willing to stand on your power, God, and your strength and your might and not our own. That's how we'll get out of these messes that we somehow find our way in. And we can also be the ones, the trailblazers, the forerunners to help help make others have their way out as well if they so happen to receive and have the ears to hear and the heart to receive the way out. Lord, I give you the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.